You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. Views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Spirit Dimension with your host, Kerry Greenaway, right here on Parasurge Radio. evening and welcome to the spirit dimension my name is Kerry Greenaway and as always on a Sunday evening I like to bring you an eclectic mix of all different things from spiritual paranormal supernatural crypto all sorts of areas tonight is no different as always I'm joined by my lovely co-host Miss Claire Hinks good evening Claire how are you good evening Kerry I'm a little bit husky this evening with the cold thing (laughs) <laughs> snotty tissues are here <laughs> oh <laughs> no not a snotty myself. tissue <laughs> not a snotty tissue going on <laughs> a bit sorry for myself. what i need you know is a good book i need a yes. good book do you know anyone that writes a good book <laughs> funnily, funnily enough i do and i've managed to get her into the studio tonight really yeah she's amazing she's awesome. written two amazing books um all about ghosts and hauntings and when you can go and see them and stuff so oh, should, just should we... my sort of book. It's a bedtime story waiting to happen. It is. It's a bedtime story waiting to happen. <laughs> should we bring her into the studio, Claire? Let's. Her name is Ruth Roper Wild, and as I say, she's written two amazing books. First of all, she wrote the book of Ghosts of Marston Vale, all about the hauntings and happenings all around the Bedfordshire area. And then she wrote the Almanac, I can never say that word, Almanac of British Ghosts, which basically details hauntings that happen on a particular night of the year, month by month basis. Good evening, Ruth. How are you? Hi, both of you. I'm fine. Nice to be here. Good. Nice to hear you. See you now. <laughs> it is very nice, nice to, to you. Uh, see you and hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so first of all, um, Ruth, what I'd like to ask you is what set you off on this journey of writing about um, paranormal happenings, should we say? Well, it's something that I've wanted to do for years and years and years, literally. Um, I think because when we were children, we lived in a house that had what would, I guess, most be described as a poltergeist. Um, So we were forever having very strange happenings going on in the house. And it just started off in me a lifelong fascination with what is it that people sense and hear and see and feel? What is it that's going on and why do some people see it and some people don't? Um, So I started reading a lot about the subject and the more I read about it, the more I wanted to write my own um, because I got a bit frustrated, I'll be honest, with reading ancient old dusty stories about ghosts that wander around castles clanking their chains. And I wanted to know who the ghosts are or whatever it is Mm -hmm. that's haunting these days that's in houses like the house I was living in. not wandering around clanking their chains in white sheets. So that's what started my interest. And I wanted to do it for years and years, but couldn't really find the time to do it until I partially retired a year and a half ago. Um, And I thought, well, what shall I do with my four days off? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, I'll scare myself silly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm glad to, I personally I don't think there's any better way to do it quite frankly I love doing all that stuff so um when you 
first set down, did you have a direction or was it just... Did you have a very first story that you had come across that you thought, oh, I'm going to look into that? Not really. Um, I had started with the idea of I would one day like to write books, like I say, some years ago. So what I'd started doing was I'd kept a database. Um, (laughs) And you're telling my age now. That started as a card file, an actual physical card file. Mm -hmm. Then I discovered that you could have a card file on a computer. So I moved it over onto an actual computer, but still a card file. Yeah. Um, And was horrified when some years later, the computer stopped doing card files. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Gadgets. It's like relearning it all over again, isn't it? (laughs) It really was. So I learned how to use an Excel spreadsheet to make a database on. Um, And I moved my databases over onto that. So I had an awful lot of data. Um, But I always had the idea I would want to gather together into a book. And the idea of doing it for roads um, and for the dates uh, was really just a way of narrowing down the topic. Because one of the things I found quite quickly once I started to actually think about putting pen to paper was you could literally write hundreds of books with the data that there is out there yeah um and you just end up having to whittle it down to something that's a sensible size so when I first thought right I'm actually going to do this I'm actually going to write a book I wrote Ghosts of Marston Vale first simply because I knew that would be quite a small book um, because it's just literally about the ghosts that haunt the area that I live in. So it's probably only a, or oh, maybe eight miles in one direction and three or four miles in the other direction, oblong, that I've written about. So obviously that was going to be quite a small book, and I wanted to write something not too hefty to begin with, just to get the whole practice of writing in. Yeah. <clears throat> so, that, so that was the rationale for starting with Marston Vale, um, plus, it meant I could persuade people in the village to come and be interviewed by me for the book with their own experiences. Um, can, I, can I just ask you, is it, was there, where, whereabouts are you? Bedfordshire. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, in the UK. So um, Marston Vale is a it, it's literally um, the remains of a glacial valley going back, obviously, millennia uh, that stretches roughly between just west of the town of Bedford and just east of uh, the city of Milton Keynes. Um, and it's sort of covers that little stretch in between. And I live in one of the small vill- villages in that stretch. So it was there quite a lot. Did people have quite a lot to say about the, about that area? They really did. I was, I was really amazed at how many people came forward with their stories. Oh, some of the, some of the stories in there are my own family members with their stories from around the Vale. And some are our friends. But then I, I put out a call on the, the local village Facebook pages um, for all the villages that are around here. I found every village page I could find around here um, and just asked people to come forward. And lots of people did. And lots of people agreed to come and meet me for coffee, which was really nice. Good excuse to go for a nice hot chocolate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they'd tell me their stories and I'd, you know, interview them for it and then write them into the book. So. Because going back to what I said earlier about I got fed up with books that just give you the old, you know, ghosts wandering around clanking their chains from centuries ago. What I really wanted to see was which of the old myths and legends from around here are still current now or are still being seen now. In You know, in which case is there something to them mm-hmm. and also to get any current ghost stories that are going on. And that's kind of a theme I've kept up through the Almanac of British Ghost, and I'm doing it with Roadmap as well, is seeing, you know, which stories are already known and are already out there, but has somebody seen that ghost since? That's yeah, so are they still, are they me. still, yeah, really fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, because you're it's taking ha- how it from many an historical these... basis. Yeah, you're taking yeah. it from a historical basis right through to modern times, and how much of that is yeah. um, a knowledge based sighting, or is it an actual paranormal occurrence that's happening absolutely and you know if people are seeing something even if it's not quite the same thing but they're seeing something in the same locale so in the same house or down the same lane or whatever it might be 
over a period of decades, then surely that in itself is a certain amount of empirical proof that something is happening. And can I just ask you, Ruth, did you find that that was ha- that happened in some places? It does. So people, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it, for me, this is the endless fascination of it. Is yeah. One of the things I find, you know, I'm sure we're all the same, those of us that are interested in the paranormal. But you go through life and if you say to somebody, um, uh, what do you do in your spare time? And you say, well, I you know, research ghosts and write about ghosts. And they look at you like you're a bit insane. And what I usually get, um, I would say about 95% of the time, is people say, oh, I don't believe in ghosts. That's complete nonsense. Mind you, there was that one time. (laughs) (laughs) And it's absolutely, I always sit there and look at them and think, but everybody does this. You know, there's probably only 5% of the people I talk to that say, never, nothing at all through their whole life, nothing odd has happened. And the rest, when you actually get into conversation, will usually pinpoint some little thing that's happened during their life that they really haven't got an explanation for. And then you go right through the range of that up to people who see ghosts quite regularly. Um, I spent most of my working career as being as an investigator of one type or another. So investigation comes second nature to me and interviewing of witnesses comes second nature. Um, and there's quite a lot of theory about witness um, interview and what people will and won't remember. Yeah. But one of the things that I've noticed really specifically about the paranormal world is if you put five people in a room and a phenomena happened in that room, the five people will come up with a different explanation as to what happened. Mm-hmm. If you haven't predetermined them to think one way or the other. So one will think everybody has a different perspective, don't they? Yeah, and it all depends what their background is, what their particular mm. belief structure is, um, you know, plus on top of that, I think we all perceive things differently from the paranormal side. So whereas I might hear it in the room, somebody else might see it, whereas somebody else might smell it. So I think there's also an actual difference in how our senses are picking up whatever's going on. But yeah. nevertheless, something went on. So that's the part that just fascinates me forever and ever and that I end up wanting to write about it all the time. That's exactly where we come from. We talk about this on a regular regular basis, isn't it, Claire? It's it's how people translate the, the phenomena, we'll call it phenomena, um, that's yeah. happened and how their own personal psychology translates that to them. And then we go to yeah, why that's... is that happening? Why are people looking at th- or seeing things in a different way? And yeah. that, I think, is the endlessly fascinating, isn't it? It is completely fascinating. It takes you into so many different areas, doesn't it? Oh, it really does. But still, you come back to the basis of whatever their um, belief structure was, whatever their different senses that come to fore were, nevertheless, something happened. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, how do we how do we explain that that's happened? Is that the spirit of the dead visiting us? Some people would absolutely you know, have have you convinced that that's the case? Others will poo-poo that and use the um, recording theory, you know, that stones or the atmosphere or whatever record happenings that, you know, particularly tragic happenings or whatever, or ones where high emotions like murder or whatever, they'll get trapped in the atmosphere and you'll get the replay theory. Mm-hmm. Um, other people think it's the human mind is picking up on the energy itself because the human mind is a, you know, vast untapped resource yeah um and there's various other theories aren't there as to what it is but nevertheless it is <laughs> at the bottom of all that something is still happening that's yeah. true yeah that's I, very very true we'll be able to you know prove what exactly it is and i always think you know as much as the books are meant to be quite fun to read you know and for people to enjoy at the same time i kind of hope that they'll add to that big wealth of knowledge out there um because of the fact that i I do this looking for historical haunting and then looking to see if i can find other people who've seen something the same in the same locale or even a different experience in the same locale that in itself adds to the weight of well then there's something odd about that locale and then maybe somebody else will be able to go along with the right equipment at some point and actually pin down what's happening 
Brilliant. Oh, interesting. Oh, I love all this. I love all this. So, <laughs> so Ruth, in your experience, um, let's have a look, you know, stick into the Bedfordshire area um, and the Ghosts of Marston Vale to start with. Um, in your experience, had you found that certain things were happening at certain places, like um, to do with, like, I know this is quite controversial, people, like ley lines or energy lines, does it seem to fit in with that kind of thing? Um, I haven't particularly come across any of that within Marston Vale, except that there clearly is quite an ancient um, civilization within this valley because we've got three, sta- well, we did have three standing stones, which are the most easterly standing stones in the whole of the British Isles, so I'm told. Um, there's only one still standing that I'm aware of. I think the other two have gone. Um, and when I say standing stones, I know you're all picturing lovely Stonehenge monolith type things, but our standing stones were about two foot tall and <laughs> looked suspiciously like concrete posts. Um, but they are nevertheless Neolithic standing stones. And there's a lovely legend about um, they're called. Um, variously, either the the devil's toenails, or the devil's jump stones, or the devil's leap stones, and that's how we know that originally there were three, because these um, tales and legends go back several centuries about them. Um, the the one that's still remaining is almost directly opposite my house. It's about oh maybe two hundred yards from where I'm sitting now, speaking to you, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a, a very innocuous little uh, stone post in the corner of a field but that obviously had some kind of significant as far back as neolithic times because they were in a straight line the three of them originally and where the line was pointing to is where the church that now stands is built but that's built on the site of an original motton bailey they think castle because the tower of our church stands separately to the church body itself um, which is extremely unusual, as you're probably mm. aware. Yeah. And I think that's because they built the tower on the base of what was the Bailey part of a Motton Bailey castle. Um, mm. So, you know, again, Motton Bailey is sort of, uh, what, about 11, 1200s, that kind of time, a bit earlier maybe. Um, so you're looking from Neolithic right back, right through. And that site must have had some sort of significance because it's very low-lying just there. Marston Mortain, where I live, Marston means town in the marsh. Um, you know, it's, it's a derivative from town in the marsh. And the Mortain was the uh, local manor family at the time. So it's always been very low lying. So why there would be a castle built there, particularly a Mott and Bailey castle, it's not your usual, you know, commanding promontory that you'd expect to find a castle on. So did they build that castle on top of an earlier pagan site or site of some significance hard to tell really but it, it, it does beg the question and it certainly had legends all along then and and then certainly with the the devil's jump stones which is a legend about why the tower is separate to the church uh it, it said that when the the good townsfolk of marston were trying to build their church the devil kept coming along overnight and moving the tower and that's why it's separate ah so, because, you know, a lot of the old tales blamed everything on the devil, as we know, and pesky man that he was kept moving the town. <laughs> well, he was a man. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's quite right. And the jump stones is a fascinating um, story about apparently when they did finally get the church built, the devil was so annoyed that they built the church and, and, put, and left the tower where he put it that he sat up on top of the tower one day um, and spotted some schoolboys who were playing truant from church that Sunday and were playing uh, leapfrog in the fields behind the church. So he jumped down and jumped over the three of them that were bent over in the leapfrog position. And then as he jumped over the last one, he gathered them all and jumped down into a pit into hell, carrying them with him. Um, And another version of the same story says as he jumped over them, he turned them to stone. Hence the three standing stones, hence the devil's jump stones or the devil's toenails, depending on which version. And in actual fact, that my house is built on the site of 
a pub that used to be standing here in the 1800s, 17 to 1800s, that was called the Jumpstones, named after the three standing stones. Oh, um, fantastic. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested. It. Isn't, yeah, no, I'm, I feel like, yeah, I'm having my bedtime story. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say, do people, what, I'm interested to know what people have sort of relayed to you then, like what, what, what sort of experiences have people had regarding the history of the place? Well, I think one of the most fascinating ones for me, um, simply because it makes me giggle every time, honestly, it really does. Uh, going back to my, you know, fascination with ghosts that have been haunting for considerable periods of time, there is a legend that down one of the lanes near here, um, you can see a, a headless rider and ghost. Uh, rider and horse so a headless rider on a horse um and she is said to be lady snag um so that's snag with a double g and an e which was the local um you know baronial family or whatever and the legend is that she was having a clandestine meeting with her lover one night and left late at night and was racing back to try and get to the manor um before her husband noticed her absence but some thieves had strung a rope across the lane. And as she galloped through, of course, it took her head off at the neck. And they then callously robbed her body of all its jewellery and finery. Um, and she was found the next morning. Uh, and her ghost obviously is said to haunt the lane ever since. The slight problem with that is that the main lady snag whose um, effigy is in the church, laid peacefully next to her husband, died as a dowager lady in her 80s. Ah. Um, and I struggle to believe that she was busy galloping up and down the lanes, seeing lovers in her 80s. Wow, well, you <laughs> never know. <laughs> I, I doubt it too, but you never yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> you, know you have to give her some kudos if she was. But <laughs> that, that ghost was seen as recently as 15, 16 years ago. Wow. So although legend and urban myth have grown up over the you know centuries in between have obviously ascribed it to the wrong person yeah nevertheless some sort of entity entity that some kind of horse figure does ride down that lane and the nearby lane and i had two people that came forward who had um experiences of it sort of within our lifetimes you know within recent yeah. history so you know it's a really good example of that story's obviously been around for centuries and it's grown a lovely myth all around it. And, you know, poor old lady Snag is probably rolling over in her grave thinking, I did what? I did not. <laughs> or, or she's sitting there going, oh, look at the reputation I've got. I'm awesome. <laughs> but this is this is a typical she, problem. Damn, this... how did they find out? <laughs> yeah, God, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a typical problem we have when we come to investigations. Like people will automatically assume we have this quite often with Anne Boleyn. If we look at all the accounts of where Anne Boleyn is supposed to haunt on a regular basis, she's a busy girl of a night. I was going to say, she's a busy lady, that one. And it may not be Anne Boleyn, it could just be a well-to-do lady and it's just because she's dressed a bit more finely than a serving girl, people have automatically assumed it's Anne Boleyn because there's a link to Anne Boleyn at that particular location. Or very often they're stretching the link as far as it possibly can go. Exactly, that's true. Yeah. It has a little bit more like, oh, I just saw the ghost of Anne Boleyn, you know, or Lady Snag. <laughs> it's funny because I've covered Anne Boleyn's um, shenanigans of a night in Almanac of British Ghosts. Because like you say, on certain nights of the year, so for example, the night she was beheaded mm -hmm. um, or on the night of her wedding day, um, she appears in quite a few places at once. So that ghost is rushing around the country putting in its appearance. I mean, she must be able to claim overtime on those nights. She must. Um. <laughs> maybe she, maybe there is a, oh, this is a really weird thing to say. Maybe you do get like paid for ghost hunt, uh, for ghost stalking. You know what I mean? Right. If you're going to be here, you can earn this much money in the afterlife. <laughs> I think that I think they pay you in a different kind. <laughs> I don't think it's Dosh, love. No, but she is one of going back to Anne Boleyn. She is one of the most well 
allegedly documented ghosts, isn't she? She is. And um, both her and her father make amazing appearances on certain nights of the year. I mean, her father is supposed to uh, have such remorse because it was him who pushed Anne Boleyn into the view of the king. Um, and then, well, some historians have decided that that's what happened. Um, because she was very, very young when she caught the eye of Henry VIII. Um, and it, some people think that it was her father that pushed her into his view. And with what happened with both her and her brother ending up being um, beheaded because of her alleged, um, you know, no longer being suitable as one of his wives. Mm. Um that the the father was so in remorse of, of losing both his children like that, that he's had to pay for his sins through history ever since by making a ride in a carriage um, on the night that she was beheaded through 10 different villages in Norfolk and he's got to make it back to their ancestral home by dawn. Um, so he, he could be seen in his carriage racing across all these various bridges in Norfolk um, trying to get back to the ancestral home of the Boleyns. Um, so, yes, both her and her father really do make quite a lot of appearances, apparently. Yeah, there's, a lot of, there's quite a lot. I've just, I'm just sitting here looking up the whole places. She haunts, my God. <laughs> said, said to haunt. She's so busy, I tell you. <laughs> she was a busy lady in life and She's she hasn't bit, stopped yeah. in death, has she? <laughs> no, she really hasn't. <laughs> Bless her cotton socks. May no. her soul rest in peace. <laughs> is all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I think she paid many a penance in life, let alone in death. Now, So those are... Oh, oh, go on. When, when you look at the history which I hadn't before writing Almanac, to be honest. I mean, we all know the the rhyme, don't we? And we all know that Henry VIII had eight wives and so on. But when you actually look a bit into the history in order to write a book about it, and you realise how shocking what he did as a monarch was mm -hmm. at the time, you know, he'd been married to his first wife for nearly 20 years, and because there was no heir, he suddenly started whizzing his way through a succession of other women mm -hmm. and changed the whole... Um, legal standing of the country and the whole religious standing of the country and dissolved all the monasteries mm -hmm. just in order to take to bed the, one, the woman he wanted to, essentially. Yeah. Uh, get round the marital laws at the time. You can imagine that when your monarch, who certainly back then was meant to have, you know, divine right and be you know, so much the head of the country starts suddenly behaving like that and turning ancient laws on the head, turning the country's religion on its head, destroying all the monasteries, getting rid of all the monks and the nuns and everything. It left such a wound on the psyche of the country that it's not really surprising that so many, um, you know, legends about the, the hauntings around that spring up. Yeah. Uh, and like you say, you know, whether it actually is Anne Boleyn or whether it's any other well-dressed lady attached to that house or that castle or whatever it might be over the centuries it's always going to be that period in history that people's minds go back to because it did such damage to the country as a whole yes mm. it affected people's belief systems and everything didn't it so the okay. if you look at the and that's why it's still impact. fresh that's why it's still fresh in everybody's mind isn't it even now you know everybody knows about Anne Boleyn and King King what's his name <laughs> <laughs> Henry. Know, King, King Henry, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, and his eight <laughs> wives, blah, blah, blah. Everybody, you know, everybody knows, don't they? Everybody knows about it. Yeah. Even all this time, you know, later. I mean, him in himself is an incredibly intriguing character um, in regards to his appetite on many levels. Um, and there are legends surrounding him as well, aren't there? Yeah, but interestingly, he doesn't, he hasn't yet popped up for any of... Because um, he doesn't seem to pop up on any particular night of the year, um, the ah. way what he did does. Um, so he didn't really pop up for Almanac of British Ghost the same way. It was more all these poor ladies that pop up <laughs> with, you know, what, what he did to them rather than him himself, rather than him as a ghost. Which sort of makes you think, oh, is that because they're troubled, you know? Did they well, a keep, woman's they, because, <laughs> yeah, because they need to keep popping up to remind people of the scorn and all that. Could be. 
could be, or it could be that people didn't dare make a legend about a king earlier on, so they made it about what he'd done rather than about him, if you know True. what I mean. Yeah. Could remove it one step. I don't know. It's it's a fascinating. I I hadn't realised what a fascinating piece of British history that is until I was re- sort of researching it in order to write Almanac. Yeah. Um, and that was you know just tracking down the, the number of times a a year that poor old Anne Boleyn makes an appearance. Um, what remember. night is the, can you remember off the top of your head what night that is allegedly she's supposed to make multiple she, appearances she appears two or three times in the book because she there's her wedding night um, and there's the night that she was beheaded and there's also what they think might be the night that he might have proposed to her ah. um, that's around Christmas time just in between Christmas and New Year I can't remember off the top of my head what the other dates were of the year because um, uh, if you read Almanac, there's an awful lot of dates with an awful lot of ghosts that like one night a year. I was absolutely astonished when I came to read write the book. Um, I was expecting that to be another small book, uh, and it turned out to be a lot bigger than I was expecting, because it seems like a lot of ghosts like to stick to one particular night of the year, which is fascinating in itself. <laughs> I was going to say, for me, that is absolutely fascinating, because if you're out there investigating, guys... This is a book that you kind of need to gear your investigations to a night that a ghost is supposed to appear. If you're going to get a chance, if you want to narrow your field of chance of seeing an alleged entity, then The Almanac of British Ghosts is kind of a really good book to be getting because it does highlight hauntings that happen on a particular night of the year. It's broken down month by month. It talks about the original story, the legends associated with historical references and any recent accounts as well. So, guys, if you are actually investigators out there, which I know a lot of you guys who listen are, this book is probably going to be a pretty damn good one to get because you could base your investigations on locations that these things are supposed to happen, which would actually help us build a better database in regards to activity. And that actually hits the nail on the head as why I laid it out like that. <laughs> because, it's like know, a Bible of places yeah. to in, in, investigate, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the one I'm currently writing at the moment goes an even step further on that. I was going to call it the sat of British Ghost, but I've decided a roadmap. Um, because, again, with that, it will be the same theory, but this will be, look, if you, you know, if you live in Leicestershire, say... Um, and you don't want to have to travel too far tonight to go and do a ghost hunt, you'll be able to just look up Leicestershire, right, well, on such and such a road, I should be able to see X, Y, and Z. And it was last seen two years ago or four years ago or whatever. Um, so that you know which ones are likely to be active according to other people's experiences rather than, you know, going to some perhaps dusty castle where the legend is maybe 200 years old and we, and we don't know whether anybody's seen it recently or not. Um, there are a lot with the castles as well, but then I look, I still look for whether or not, you know, somebody's seen them more recently. Uh, and, and I did with that the same with Almanac. So yeah, that, that was the whole idea that people would be able to sort of go along, um, and, and try to actually see something themselves. See, that is why I think this book in itself is an absolutely one of the essential tools that any paranormal investigation team should be working with because you've done the kind of pre-work before, you know, you've not just gone, oh, that's a cheap location, we'll go there, because it could be a battlefield or something like that, couldn't couldn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So what's the most famous reoccurring activity... I'll use that word loosely, of a battlefield that you came across? Um, well, Edge Hill is an obvious, um, and so is um, Glencoe. In fact, the, the photograph at the, on the cover of the book is Glencoe. Um, both of those, obviously, you know, very bloody battles at the time. The one at Edge Hill was said to have replayed... Um, almost to the point where you could make out individual soldiers for several nights um, within the sort of few months after the battle actually occurred, so much so that the king sent um, emissaries to go and watch it. But in actual fact, when you delve into the history of that, what you find is that that 
uh, legend comes from pamphlets that were printed at the time giving that information. Now, obviously, back in those days, they didn't have newspapers. So if they wanted to spread information around the country, they printed pamphlets. Um, and these things were <laughs> sensational, to say the least. They would put anything they wanted in these pamphlets because nobody had any way of checking facts like we do these days. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if a little bundle of these pamphlets was set down in some remote village, that would be all the news they heard for several months. So, of course, they were much more likely to believe it than we would be today. Yeah. Um, and actually, when the historians have looked at the pamphlets, they're very much written to um, make it seem that the king was in the right and the people opposing him were in the wrong at that battle. And that's why the battle was replaying in the sky, because God was angry about the people going against their king. So there was a whole psychological warfare going on there. But nevertheless, sights and sound of that battle have continued over the years, obviously not to the extent that those pamphlets um, alleged at the time. But I can't help but wonder if that means that at the time, there was, you know, if you like, for want of a better word, an ordinary ghostly happening going on, and they just bumped it up for sensationalism. And that's still gone on over the centuries. You know, there's, there's quite recent... Um, you know, sounds of musket shots, sounds of men screaming and so on going on around Edge Hill on the anniversary of the battle. And the same for Glencoe. You know, you get very recent um, stories of people seeing the high, a Highlander say, you know, very muddy and wearied and bloodied looking, walking alongside the road as they drive past in their car and they sort of turn their head in shock only to see that it's gone, what they saw and so on. So... Yeah, I think, you know, sites like that really do hold some sort of psychic imprint or something from what's gone on. Mm -hmm. mm. Very yeah. much so. Yes, I, I agree with that, actually. That's kind of an area that I'm researching at the moment. So that sort of thing really interests me. So I'm going to be getting this book because I think this could be a valuable source of information for the work that I'm doing in the background. This is a really good reference book as well, isn't it? I mean, even if you're not a, a, a paranormal investigator per se, it's just really interesting to read a book of, of haunted areas, places, in, especially in the UK, isn't it? Because we're like, it's there's a lot of history you've put in the book as well. Yeah, and it's it's just really really interesting read. Well, and it's easy going as well. Like some books can be quite heavy going, can't they, with that sort of information? But Yours yeah, isn't like that. It's quite fresh and easy to read. Yeah, it can be read in sort of bite-sized chunks because, like mm -hmm. like you mentioned earlier, it's laid out month by month um, and date by date. So the idea that I, I had when writing it and laying it out like that was, I mean, here we are on March the 25th. So you could look up March the 25th in the book and see whether there was anywhere, you know, worth visiting that day. Now, whether that was because you were a ghost hunter or just to do a family outing and be yeah. able to... You know, if your kids were going through that phase of being interested in ghosts or what have you, you know, or Aunt Nelly or whatever, you know. It's... Family, family ghost days out. <laughs> no, no, I've done that. No, seriously, I have done that. <laughs> uh, one of my oh, dates, one of my very first dates um, <laughs> with my ex-husband, ex, you notice, um, he said, where do you want to go? And I went, Borley, Borley. And he was like, okay, why, what's at Borley? I went, well, it used to be a rectory, but it's not a rectory anymore. But apparently there's ghost, <laughs> ghost sightings there on a regular basis. I want to go there. And bless his little cotton socks, he sort of like, you know, went along with that. And so, yeah, no, family days out or date days. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> well, and, and yeah. My, my great nephew, bless him, and now I really am showing my age. He, he's, I think he's 14. He'll probably kill me if he listens to this and I've got his age wrong. Um, but he's just, you know, really, really interested in ghosts at the moment. So, you know, it's been great for him and his dad to go along to some of the places that I've mentioned in the book for them to. In fact, they're mentioned in the book, which they're even happier about um, to, you know, to be able to go and, and have a look at these places because you can just look up what's near you mm -hmm. and on a date that's relevant, you know. I think that's yeah. brilliant. And I, as, as, as I said before, as a paranormal investigator, this is kind of a Bible if you want to really catch something, you have a higher chance of a reoccurring haunting 
which is all laid out with you know we've said it before month by month day by day date by date um original stories legends hauntings and historical references i mean it's all in this book guys and i'm sure that ruth probably could write another three books like this i'm sure there was like loads you left out yeah um uh, what, what i tended to leave out was things where i really couldn't find anything other than just the bare bone original story um because they're the ones that well frankly bored me when i was reading other books you know i i think it's it comes from having been an investigator most of my life you know in my working life i don't want just the bare bones i want to know why and who saw it and you know what's the background behind them being there and is that historically accurate or not um and you know another thing that fascinates me is with a lot of the dates they go back before the change of the Gregorian to the Gregorian calendar, Ooh. which means theoretically they shouldn't be haunting on that date anymore. Anyway, they should be haunting. Yeah. I think it's is it nine nine or eleven days later? I forget. It says in the book somewhere. Um, it, you know, it's a number of days later that they should be haunting if they're sticking to the date of the actual occurrence. And yet, with people today are still seeing them on what we call that date, but it isn't the same day of the year as it was because of the change of the calendar from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. That leads me then into a question for you. Do you think then it is something that's linked more to a psychological unconscious collective than it is an actual haunting? When it's on a specific date of the year, do you mean, or hauntings in general? No, well, either, actually. But on a date, because we expect it to be on that date, even though we had that Gregorian change, people go, oh, it was, the tw- say, for example, the 25th of March. It happened on the 25th of March. It didn't. It happened on a different date because of the change. But because people have got that date in their head, do you think that's why people are I, experiencing by, by that? Time, yeah. By the time I'd finished writing Almanac and researching for it, I'd actually more or less come to the conclusion that if the hauntings were active, um, you know, even fairly sporadically, but actually you were just as likely to see it on any night generally around that period rather than the specific night. Ah. Because what you would actually find was, say, for example, um, the alleged murder happened on the 1st of September. Mm-hmm. When it... What you'd actually find when you were looking at references was it got more active around September, end of August. And there aren't that many more accounts from any other part of the year. So it seemed to be, to me, and again, I didn't do any scientific analysis of this, that this is just the feeling I ended up with having done the research. Yeah. Is you end up with clusters of paranormal activity around a certain date. So whether that's something to do with it gradually builds up to a peak on what would have been the date and then gradually fades away again, um, that's kind of how it began to feel to me. But then there were other hauntings where, although it's alleged to be on one night of the year, actually you can find them scattered throughout the year, you know, in that location. Ah. That tends to suggest that they're mostly active, that haunting regardless. And that that's probably another case of, there is something going on there, but we in our minds are ascribing it to a certain historical reference, you know, that goes with that building or that site or whatever. But the ones where, particularly battles, what seems to happen is it ramps up, peaks, and then gradually fades around, say, a month at either side of the date. So perhaps two or three weeks before, two or three weeks after. Okay. But then if you really think about a battle, that's not that surprising, is it? Because really. I was just going to say that. No, it's like the build up to, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, then the kind been... of the come down from. Yeah. You know, there must have been, you know, those armies as they, you know, because then almost all of them are civil war. I mean, there's, you know, there's a fair few from, you know, the troubles with Scotland and what have you. Um, but there must have been periods when the, the opposing armies were sort of skirting around each other and, wondering whether they were going to get engaged in a battle and being frightened for their lives and Mm -hmm. you know the whole i know we say eve of battle but but the truth is evil eve of battle is probably a couple of weeks period isn't it yeah where you know the opposing army has been sighted 
20 miles away and then 10 miles away and you're trying to find each other mm-hmm. but at the same time not be the one that gets ambushed and not be the one that gets surprised there must be quite a bit of dancing about before they yeah. actually finally meet and clash and yeah. all of that the fear and heightened senses and you know and of course the whole political issues that were going on at the time you know that people feeling so strongly about the issues mm-hmm. you know brother fighting brother and so on in those battles that there was just such a gamut of human emotion going on it's not really surprising when you think about it that it would be either side and then obviously after the battle or you know however many people have died in the battle and then you've got there must have been days when there was dead bodies lying around on the field while they gradually got it cleared up and oh yeah it must have come you know and and the the morning must have gone on and etc etc so it wasn't yeah. It wasn't like it was over in two or three hours, and that's the only spot in which you can see the activity now. I think people forget this factor of it. They they just see, like, well, the two armies met on this field. But you're right, it's that build-up that happened and that juggling for geological positioning for advantage. Yeah. You know, higher ground, lower ground, that sort of thing. You know, that all that was taken into consideration. There would have been a lot of moving around to get that positioning right so you're right when you think about it it's not just as simple as turn up on the day have your fight go home again and like yeah. and like you say post battle you're too exhausted to be walking home again you've got to have that time where you you know like you say the battlefields would have been scoured they would have been dealt with there's there would have been a lot of um injury and also if it was too injured, they used to just euthanize. Yeah, on the battlefield. That that's well known. But fact. this, but it always, but it spreads over. It's not just that, like we say, exactly. it's not just that area, is it? It spreads over miles and miles yeah. of a battle. It can do, yeah. So it's so, not surprising, really, if ghosts are walking around and things, uh, that there is sightings of them all over the place. Is it really? Not really. And, and this comes back to my, when you really talk to people, even though most people say, oh, I don't believe in that, I've never... And then when you really get talking to them, oh, well, actually, there is that one time. And yeah. it, it makes you think, I mean, you know, my, my friends will laugh at me because I'll quite happily go ghost, ghost hunting in broad daylight. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, I've been ghost hunting twice this week and once was in broad daylight. Because why shouldn't they be seen in broad daylight? A lot of the accounts I come across was in broad daylight yeah yeah and a lot of my own experiences happened in broad daylight so i don't think there's anything about the time of the day or anything i think it's about if there's going to be a haunting if there happens to be somebody there to perceive it or not well as a medium and speaking from experience the spirit and ghosts are walking around all day long yeah. with their with their people with in the places where they want to be whether they're haunting or whether they're just there because they resonate to that energy of the building or the area or they they are walking among us constantly could you ask them to stay out of my bathroom though what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> or I'm my ghost and how much all the research I do it's just like I get that they're everywhere, but could they please just stay out of the bathroom? (laughs) (laughs) And I would just like to add the bedroom. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) People say to me all the time, I say, they're watching you, you know, and I give them validation. And I say, they're watching you. Are they watching everything? I say, yeah. And they say, what, everything? I was like, well, you know, they can be discreet. But, you know, they don't leave you alone. They don't leave me alone anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> don't leave me alone. <laughs> Most leave the shower at I'm times not... <laughs> is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so, Ruth, what's the strangest experience you've encountered whilst doing some researching that you've done? Um, do you mean in terms of the research itself, or uh, you know, whilst out and about hunting? Okay, so let's go personal experience first. What's your most personal experience? that you've had well I guess yeah I get I mean I've had so many honestly um but I guess for me the most intense period was that a house as a child when we had what would be classed as a poltergeist um you know and one particular memory sticks in my mind always 
my sister is 18 months older than me and she and I shared a bedroom uh, and the house that we lived in had uh, our end of the house where you know our parents and us children lived and then it had another little annex house stuck on the side of it where our grandparents lived now for some reason when we first moved into the house don't know why I was a kid never thought to ask our parents ripped out the bathroom in our end intending to redo it and never did so the whole family used the main bathroom over in our grandparents side of the house which was accessed by going through our parents bedroom upstairs there was a downstairs loo that you could use as well but the actual main bathroom um was was in the grandparents side of the house now my grandparents did a lot of traveling in that period of our lives so they were often away and the often their side of the house was often empty and my sister suddenly stopped wanting to go and have a bath at all and she was forever nagging me and that will you come with me will you come with me come and sit in the bathroom with me no i won't (laughs) i've got other things to be doing and eventually she admitted it was because she was really scared in there and eventually she admitted it was because something kept banging on the door while she was in the bathroom and frankly i thought that was a load of absolute flipping nonsense and it was probably our brother who was younger than both of us playing tricks on her so eventually one day i agreed to go and sit in the bathroom with her while she was having the bath so there she was in the bath there i was sitting with the toilet lid down sitting on top of the toilet um and we were talking quietly when all of a sudden somebody came and hammered on that bathroom door like you would not believe it was properly shaking the door they were hammering so hard on it and they were grabbing hold of the handle and shaking the door violently in its frame my sister started to scream and to go to speak to me and I instantly shushed her to not speak to me because I was convinced it was my brother stood the other side of it scaring her and I didn't want him to know that I was in the bathroom with her Mm -hmm. so whilst the pounding and shaking of the door was still going on and my sister was still screaming I ran to that door and I flung it open intending to confront him and there was nobody there And I ran out into the hallway and I searched out for him. He wasn't even in the house. He wasn't even in that evening. Wow. <clears throat> and yet I know, you know, that the violence with, 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 with which that door was being pounded on as I flung it open. Uh, I mean, you, you'd have to experience it to believe it, but it, it really was quite shocking how violent that door was being pounded on when I flung it open and there was nobody there. Needless to say, I went with her forevermore after that. Didn't leave her to go in the bathroom again on her own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <Hi. laughs> oh, and wow. okay. So what's the strangest, um, should we say, coincidence or synchronicity, whichever way you want to look at it, that you've had whilst researching a story for one of your books? Actually, for me, the one that I was genuinely fascinated by if you like was the one for Goodrich Castle um and there's a a legend there that on a particular battle night you know centuries ago um I think it was the English Civil War again off off the top of my head but whichever battle it was that was going on on one side of the battle was a young knight on the other side of the opposing forces was his lover who was the um captain of the castle's daughter he happened to be visiting her at the point that things came to a head and the two armies were going to clash they knew that if he was caught in the castle on the wrong side as it were Mm -hmm. you know his life was going to be forfeit so the two young lovers tried to escape before you know on the eve of the battle before it all came to a head and legend has it they got on a, a horse together rode down out of the castle and tried to cross the river at the foot of the castle of the castle to escape but it was quite a stormy night and they got swept away by the high rising water them and their horse and were drowned and oh. ever since then their their ghosts you know their forlorn ghosts have been seen haunting the castle on that night um so whilst trying to find uh, people who'd been to goodrich castle on that night who had experienced something I came across a fishing blog by some chap who'd been fishing in the river below um, and had been recording a a, a blog for himself, you know, like a lot of people do, don't they? But for fishing purposes, not anything to do with ghosts. 
And in the back of it, he'd caught an EVP of a voice saying something like, get over here, or you can cross here, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't on the same night of that alleged haunting, but it was, you know, within a a reasonable period of it. And I, I just always had a feeling that he'd inadvertently caught the sound of their ghosts trying to get across the river. Yeah. Down below. And, and he, he wasn't looking for them. He, you know, he was, he was, uh, it was to do with fishing. So yeah, for me, they, those are the best, valid, the best ones, aren't they? Yeah. You know, and, and his camera caught an EVP. Mm. So yeah, it does, it, that does fascinate me, that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like you say, he's out there fishing. His mind's not on ghost hunting or paranormal no. activity or anything like that. He's just doing his fishing thing. And, yeah. and he happens to just capture something. That's, that does have a link to, you know, or could have a link yeah. to that nearby ghost story, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think, you know, that's, for me, that's what the research is so fascinating. It's all very well seeing, you know, the well-published version of a ghost story, if you like, that, you know, if, if, you, if you pick up any book or any... Um, you know google it or whatever you get that one version that everybody tells mm-hmm. and what i have tried to do is to dig deeper than that and find other people or other versions or nearby versions i mean in the coming book i'm not going to give too much away because it really is my absolute favorite but just wait until you see the phantom lorry Ooh. it's Ooh. just I, it absolutely when you see how far i've traced it across the country the phantom lorry um you know and they don't seem to have been linked together ever before but i'm pretty sure it's the same lorry okay so talking about your new book you're currently looking at ghosts of roads and highways in the uk aren't you yes yes so So guys this is a shout out to the community we would love for you to get in contact with ruth if you have any stories or legends regarding ghosts of roads and highways because Ruth would be really interested as she's writing a book on this particular topic right now. So please, I've shared all the links into the chat room where you can track down Ruth. Um, Please get in contact with her if you've got any stories. I'm going to so have you back on Ruth, I'm telling you now, (laughs) because you are fascinating to talk to. We could listen to stories of, you know, the historical references and everything that you bring out about these stories. They're absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for doing what you do. I love your approach um, on how you write your books because it's not just, here's another ghost story, fireside ghost story. It's backed up with what everything you can, every side of it that you can. So thank you so much for doing that. Well, I, I really enjoy it and I really enjoyed tonight as well. So I'm always happy to come back and yak ghosts endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love to talk yeah, ghosts on Paris. Yeah, yes. we love talking um, ghost stories on Parasearch Radio. We most certainly do. Now, guys, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show. We've got a couple of minutes to go. Um, don't forget, tomorrow is my live on the Facebook, the Parasearch Radio Facebook group page, giving you an idea of everything that's coming up in the following week to give you a little taster now. Next week's topics, um, we have got some Monday evening, we've got, we talk, started talking skinwalkers and went on to the Demon House, uh, the, lo- the latest Zach Baggins offering. Um, definitely one to listen to that one because Jay had an extreme point of view on that one. Um, we're talking Basilica Axe Murder House. We're talking haunted artwork. We've got rock stars and the paranormal. We have a para search birthday next week as well. Tune in tomorrow on the para search radio group page live to hear all about that one. And we're hitting Easter. So we're going to be bringing you some Easter paranormal stories and breaking down the Easter story, looking at it from a paranormal perspective. That should be very, very interesting. And on Sunday, next Sunday, Claire, we have Mr. Ashley Mortimer and his good friend Steve Ward in the studio. And we are talking all about how religion has certain themes that run through and also how that links into occultism. 
Wow. I better start <laughs> researching then. I know. That one, that's when, when that one came to the table, I was like, okay, I better do oh, some work on that one. <laughs> I think I might have a headache before I start. <laughs> but that's okay because I have two experts in the studio with us next week. Okay. I've got Mr. Well, I Ash- might learn some stuff. I might learn some stuff. Honestly, <laughs> these two guys are absolutely fantastic. Mr. Ashley Mortimer and Mr. Steve Ward will be in the studio. <laughs> on that note, thank you so much, Ruth, for joining us. Um, in the studio we will definitely be having you back on because you're absolutely fascinating to talk to so thank you for joining us thank you both it's been really pleasurable Claire yes thank you Ruth as always it's an absolute pleasure oh it has been a pleasure I'm sorry about my coughing blast (laughs) (laughs) oh don't worry about that I went through the whole of December doing that last year so don't worry about that that. (laughs) (laughs) I think I've done quite well to get to almost you know April without getting a cold, you know. You've done incredibly <laughs> well. Live. Of course oh, you will. Thanks. You dare not. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. I'll still be having you on even through, <laughs> even if it's still a Ouija board. Anyway, on that note, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us in the chat room. Fascinating watching your comments pass by, as always. And on that note, we bid you a very farewell. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.